Hello, my name is Suzanne James and welcome to the Green Left Show. Before we begin, I'd like to recognise the traditional owners of this land on which we live and work and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. I'd also like to recognise all people of diversity in all its many forms and champion their right to self-determination. Speaking of self-determination, today's Green Lab show has a special guest, Lizzie O'Shea. Lizzie is founder and chair of Digital Rights Watch Australia. She's a human rights lawyer, an activist, writer and broadcaster. She's written two books, Empowering Women and Future History. She's been widely published, including in the New York Times, where she wrote an excoriating article about Australia's chronic gambling problem and how our governments are just as addicted to the game as the players. She's a recipient of the 2019 Human Rights Hero Award for her work on Australians, for her work on Australia's encryption laws. Her special interest areas include post-September 11 overreach in all things data privacy and collection in the name of AML, CTF and national security, and the vexing question of Australia's gambling industry reform. She joins us now, Lizzie O'Shea. Thank you so much for joining us on the Green Lab Show. Thank you so much for having me on. It's great to be here. In your book, Empowering Women, one of the core principles is empowerment through the use of digital technology. Given that you're chair and founder of Digital Rights Watch Australia and also a human rights lawyer with many professional commitments and, of course, now a new mum, how is the digital landscape working for you right now? What's working and what would you like to see change? Uh, well, of course, I've got a very obliging baby, which helps. Uh, he lets me drag him around to various places uh, and, um, you know, make various commitments while around him and his life, which I'm grateful for. So he extends me quite a bit of forbearance. Um as mentioned, I'm, pay, I'm paid to be off work. I, I am surprised, I suppose, to realise many fellow parents um, are not in the same position. They may not be able to experience long periods of time off work that is paid and that we need to elevate that entitlement. That's one of the things I've realised in this period of. I mean, I really enjoy having a balance of work um, that I do as a volunteer with Digital Rights Watch, with, um, you know, some of my other writing gigs, and then also um, having you know, the capacity to care for my child doing care work. And, you know, it reminds me of that Karl Marx quote where he talks about you doing four different things in a day, whether it's being a fisherman, um, being a critical thinker. I can't remember what the other ones are, but I do feel like it's kind of the optimum way to live, to do a bit of everything, a bit of care work, um, a bit of time for contributing to public discussion about political topics. Um, and ov obviously over time I'll end up doing paid work as well and and critical thinking as a, a participant in society. So I think um, actually I'm living kind of that that dream a bit, which is really enjoyable. Um, of course, I think it may be more challenging when I'm back in the, the paid workforce and that doesn't blind me to the fact that many others aren't so lucky as me, but th this should be the standard that everyone enjoys. There is indeed a digital divide in Australia. You talk in your book Future Histories a lot about the nexus between socialism, digital self-determination and governments mistreating people. Well, Robo Debt is obviously one of the best examples ever of that. The largely digitised COVID response also left a lot of people behind and the government swiftly found that many people didn't have the 24-7 connectivity. Their policies and their response assumed everybody did. Homeschooling is a good example of that. QR codes, another one. Fax records, not to mention Centrelink access. All extremely difficult for the digitally disadvantaged and by default, obviously, the financially disadvantaged. It's pretty hard to maintain a smart home and stay connected if you're, for example, in a DV or homeless shelter. Whose job is it to fix that very complex web of di digital neglect, classism, political self-interest? And how can activists and advocates effectively lobby for digital equality when so many people have been left behind and aren't reliably connected still? <laughs> 
Yeah, I think it's an astute observation. I think what the pandemic has shown us is that dependence on the infrastructure of the internet and uh, its various social layers as well, not just the actual network physically itself, um, is a very pressing question. How can we make sure that access is guaranteed, but also that access is facilitated in a way that gives people rights rather than um, treats them as objects that can have a will imposed upon them. So what I mean by that is, of course, you're right to point out that there's a digital divide. There's a difference between connectivity and access to the network across the country. And it generally falls to people in disadvantage who are less able to connect to the internet as a basic right. But then there's much more complexity to just the availability of the network. It's also how you engage with the network itself. And a lot of people um, may not have access to a smartphone that might also tend towards older people, for example, who are less familiar with the technology. But there's a lot of people also who are mobile first, who don't have access to a desktop and do many things through their mobile phone instead. And so this is where the kind of complexity around how we deal with this as a social issue is really important. Because I think a lot of people who are perhaps mobile first, who tend to be uh, more disadvantaged, often also are then more dependent on privately owned social infrastructure of the web. So I'm thinking here of of programs like Facebook or platforms um, similar to that, other social media platforms, free, free email services, for example, where the trade is you provide data to these companies and you get a free service in return. And then, of course, there's a whole nother layer of complexity around how the government makes use of digital infrastructure to deliver welfare services. There's a really interesting report on this exact topic by the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, um, who was at the time, at least in 2019, where he talks about the digitisation of the welfare state and creation of of what Virginia Eubanks, an author, has called a digital poorhouse, where digital infrastructure is used not to alleviate poverty, but actually manage the poor. And once you come in contact with the government, then uh, that information point is treated as something that can help shape your future as a, a form of coercive control at times in terms of taking away privileges and entitlements that the welfare state delivers. So instead of treating people as rights holders, they're treated as a cohort that can be managed and controlled. And so I think all these complexities um, are overlaid uh, or become clear, should I say, in the course of the pandemic. The the um, the inequality that really exists that is social that is economic which is then expressed in in digital terms and I think one of the things I think is really important about Digital Rights Watch is we do take a rights-based approach so we do want to see people have rights rather than um then access to the welfare state, state somehow being treated as a privilege or as a customer service relationship that instead you've got an entitlement to be able to get an education, to be able to get um, access to welfare payments, but also if you need to use social media infrastructure to maintain contact with people, that you don't become dependent on a private enterprise to do that for you who can take it away at any time, like Facebook did with the News Media Bargaining Code, where it stripped all news um, off its platform. And then many people who are dependent on that to, to receive news, to receive health information, were in a very difficult spot. So I think there's lots of different components that we can do to um, to address some of these inequalities as they take form in, in digital settings. But having a rights-based approach, I think, is the first and foremost way to tackle it because we need to treat people as, as rights holders. But then also putting the onus back on government to make sure that services are delivered in a way that is rights-respecting, but also that the infrastructure is there to allow people to participate in online life without becoming beholden to private enterprise. And so those are some of the big picture ideals, I think, that we can start to talk about if we're interested in tackling some of these problems. And the last thing I'll say is I think Digital Rights Watch plays a really important role in civil society in terms of advocating for some of these causes. You know, a lot of us are self-avowed privacy nerds, and I think a lot of this comes down to personal information, who gets to control it, and we're happy to do that advocacy. But I think there's also other organisations who deal with people who are actually experiencing poverty that have a role to play in terms of elevating their digital literacy, working with their cohorts to elevate digital literacy across the board. And so it's about also putting those people at the primary in the primary position to advocate for change as well so it's not just a theoretical idea of privacy of um, digital infrastructure reform that it's actually also led by people who are experiencing poverty and people who understand the difficulties that come when you're forced to use digital services in a way that doesn't res- that don't in ways that don't respect your rights remote indigenous communities in particular can find it very difficult to get connected stay connected and effectively access government services. You've been a long time advocate for refugees and the Indigenous community, including helping one community beat a nuclear waste dump 
that was set to be put on their traditional land. In that context, what's your view on the Indigenous voice to Parliament? And what is your view on what should be the first priority for Indigenous Australians? Yeah, I think this is a really interesting question. I mean, I talked to um, my various Aboriginal friends, including uh, people I'm still in contact with from that case that you mentioned um, to stop the proposed nuclear waste dump at Muckety Station. And I think a lot of people are reserving their position until they see the text of any proposed referendum. I think there is some um, valid criticism to be made of the process in the sense that it's very difficult, I think, federally to set up a voice to parliament when you're dealing with 200 plus nations, 200 plus language groups uh, at the time of first contact, which is now obviously quite a different society from what it was then. But the idea that there's a single Aboriginal voice, I think, is something that we should be a bit critical of and, and not accept without thinking it through. So, you know, I, I, I also understand that there's some representative element that has to change at a federal level in our constitution, our, you know, foremost foundational legal document, and that it may be very difficult to do that in a nuanced way. And maybe this voice to parliament is the answer, at least in the in the short term, to dealing with that problem. And so what I would say is, I think it represents something and to the extent this referendum occurs, um, if it were to lose or to be unsuccessful, I think that would also be a, an enormous problem. But I don't think we should necessarily assume this is the answer to the problem of Indigenous disenfranchisement. And I think there are other guides as well. What's happening in Victoria, at least, with the treaty process, whereby there's a more democratic approach and more representative approach of different language groups, different families coming to the table, negotiating um, how they might be able to move forward together with the, the state government is perhaps an alternative guide. And I see some merit in that being more representative, more accountable, and perhaps also more inclusive and, and participatory. And, you know, I'm I'm not just guided by my own thoughts on it, but as a legal scholar, but also by other people who are going through this process as Aboriginal people. Um, and, you know, that, they're, that they see a way to be more invested in that process than the voice to parliament process. So I think there's some, um, you know, criticisms that we have to invariably have, and there's some that are more justified than others. Uh, but, you know, I can understand why Aboriginal people might be sceptical of the voice to parliament, but I can also understand why it might be something that we ought to support uh, for the risk that it may fail and that would be a worse outcome than if it were not to succeed. But I think if it is to succeed, it's really the beginning, not the end of this process. And uh, there's a lot more work to do in Australian society to address the, the considerable wrongs that have happened as a result of colonialism. What's your view on the cashless debit card as it relates to Indigenous community? As I understand it, it's been at least partially rolled back, but there's still an option for people to voluntarily sign up if they feel it would be beneficial. Is that correct? Uh, I think there's different approaches in different parts of the country. Um, but, yeah, you can definitely, you can elect to, uh, I think, have your income quarantined. Um, I'm I'm not sure. I haven't checked the recent stats as to where it's, whether it's still mandatory and where. Um, but there was also, as you may know, um, planned rollouts, I'm not sure how far there's progressed in terms of geographic areas rather than just Aboriginal people, which I think is interesting too. I mean, what do I think about it? I think um, it's patronising, uh, it's paternalistic, it suggests that Aboriginal people can't manage their money, it's humiliating to have to go and only be able to shop in certain places and to be treated um, like you were a ward of the state, you know, in the in the 20th century. It seems extremely outdated to me. If we want to address problems that are associated with uh, things like alcohol in Aboriginal communities, which seems to be the at least stated purpose for these kinds of programs, then we're going to have to do the hard work around addressing the social wrongs of and and you know economic material wrongs of um of dispossession rather than imposing these kinds of paternalistic processes as a as a solution i think there's lots more work that could be done to speak to communities themselves of course some people may wish to volunteer for this kind of income quarantine and that's on them but imposing it as a blanket um requirement for all people who are welfare recipients i think it's paternalistic towards aboriginal people and the next step will be that other people who aren't aboriginal will experience this next which is you know i think what we started to see is as the um as times progressed so a paternalistic approach to welfare in my view is something that the left should re re should reject should reject um, and we should be understanding people as entitled to welfare uh, and that includes spending it as they wish and the social harms that we might perceive from other causes are something we have to address in alternative means. I'd like to turn now to the question of government overreach 
after September 11, specifically the 2006 Anti-Money Laundering Counter-Terrorism Financing Act, known in financial circles as AMLCTF. Now, as we know, that was literally purpose-built in order to remove any financial privacy on the ground that anyone, anywhere, anytime could be laundering money or, ter or financing terrorism. Yet anyone seeking basic checks at the time that legislation was debated in Parliament we caught all sorts of names like terrorist sympathisers and traitors, something to which I'm sure Andrew Wilkie would attest. Fast forward then to October 22, when you were quoted by Green Left as saying, and I quote, Australia leads the pack in terms of number of national security laws passed in response to 9-11. We are now close to 100 different pieces of terror legislation. Many require companies to hold mountains of information, like a metadata retention regime, and then put the data at risk by, for example, weakening encryption as with the Access of Assistance Act, unquote. Now, state and federal governments of all persuasions have spent the last 20 years building that lack of privacy into everything data related. Now in 2023, is it realistic to believe that we can now retrofit privacy protection? And how does Digital Rights Watch suggest we go about that, given that, as Adam Bent once said, many politicians will remain complicit, especially whenever a proposal has national security scrawled on the front in crayon? Yeah, it's a nice line from Adam Bant. I hadn't heard it before you before you mentioned it then, so it's a it's a good one. Um, so it's true we lead the pack. I mean, yeah, close to a hundred pieces of legislation. I think uh, widely perceived as one of the more aggressive jurisdictions in terms of legislating in response to the supposed risk of terrorism. And, you know, it's in relation to um, financial transactions, as you mentioned, but also uh, in relation to lots of other things, powers given to security agencies. Um, of course, in digital settings, the power to break encryption, to force companies to build in back doors, which cause great um potential risk that the, those backdoors will be used by others. So all sorts of um, serious problems that come from widespread legislation in response to counter to, to the threat of terrorism without a proper counterweight in the form of an active civil society to resist it, an active social movement that can challenge this mandate. I think, um, uh, I, I suppose, what, what, what would I say about that, that generally? I think um, part of the reason is uh, that we... I have to say, uh, we don't have any kind of rights in our legal regime. We don't have a Human Rights Act. We don't have a charter of any description um, that is enforceable that government has to take into account in putting in place these laws. So equivalent jurisdictions like the United States, for example, has the constitutional amendments that give rights to citizens, which, of course, curbs to some degree some of the initiatives of the state in this respect. And also in Europe, um, there's obviously European rights that exist and, um, and local regimes as well. Um, that give people greater protections. We don't exist in that world. So we have, we're part of the Five Eyes Surveillance Alliance, but we don't actually have any rights in our law, which makes us a kind of low point or a testing zone as well for more aggressive forms of legislation that wouldn't be able to be passed in other parts of the world. It's not to say that these other parts of the world don't have very serious surveillance regimes, but I think we're in, a, in an unfortunate spot as Australians because of those, those factors, the fact that we're part of an, a, a national security alliance in the form of the Five Eyes, but also that we don't have a, laws enshrine, that enshrine rights. What I think we can do about it is um, is take some of that back. And I think part of why I'm so passionate about privacy, which I think some people find boring or think is um, outdated, I think actually it's completely wrong. I think we could actually reform privacy law in all sorts of interesting ways to curb the excesses of the surveillance state. Um, you know, one of the things that, that many people talked about in the wake of the Optus uh, data breach uh, last year was that huge amounts of information were held, very sensitive information by Optus, uh, for the purposes of national security that were required to hold this information for the purposes of the Australian government, being able to track who had access to a phone account and the like. I mean, some of the information I'm sure as well in relation to Optus was held because they like holding data, they're, they're data hoarders, um, and they didn't necessarily see any downside in continuing to do that or security risk that they had to manage. And, you know, that shows that the factoring is not, is not uh, the balance is not right among these companies um, 
to treat cybersecurity as an important issue that they owe, an uh, obligation that they owe to their customers. But I think that, that that's a perfect example where we can talk about how privacy and security go together, that if we can avoid companies um, being required to hold significant amounts of personal information, it actually makes our society more secure because it reduces the surface attack area for hackers that are criminal or state-sponsored hacking, for example. So I think there's a perfect argument right now about how privacy um, can undermine, um, you know, risks that we face as a society, but also is the right thing to do in terms of giving people the right to participate in society without being surveilled. And it's a very concrete, obvious example that people can identify with. Uh, and, you know, as we talk about other kinds of hacks as well, like Medibank, people don't want their personal information when it relates to health being available to, to hackers either. And I think, I think there's lots more we could do to reform privacy law uh, with government on side, you know, because they also want to condemn this kind of behaviour and, and make it more difficult for that to occur. So I think we're in a, um, a really important um, point in privacy law reform. The, the other main reason, of course, is that the Act, the Privacy Act, is currently under review and it's due to be reviewed in the new, in, in 2023 and we expect it will be reformed and so it's a matter of how much reform we get. This is the perfect moment to be advocating for serious reforms to privacy law that can give people the right to participate in society without constantly being surveilled to undermine the data-driven economy but also protect people from state-sponsored and criminal hacking and make sure that government isn't complicit in creating an environment where that's more likely to occur. I think all these discussions, it's it's great to be having them and this is where we can turn it into real reform. I don't think by any means the horse is bolted and there's no use in, in dealing with this. I think there's lots to be gained and this is the perfect moment to be doing so. So we expect 2023 to be a pretty busy year for Digital Rights Watch and for anyone who's interested in these topics, um, they're of course welcome to join us. It's a failure of legislation too, isn't it? Many companies were panicked by the very heavy-handed rollout of the AML CTF Act. People were threatened with regulatory visits and all sorts of sanctions if the requirements weren't met. But at the same time, we also know most corporations won't comply unless you can hold a legislative gun to their head and force them to do so. What's your view on that? I agree. And also what I would say is that um, while I appreciate... Um, Adam Vance's remark about, um, you know, politicians responding to the call to reform um, very quickly and attentively when it comes from the national security state is that that I have in the last sort of, I don't know, I suppose 10 years that I've been watching this space, seen that start to turn. It's not the case now that these things just go unnoticed. It's, the, it's definitely the case that um, as national security laws are put up and considered by the House, not only is there significant opposition often to the worst successes of those proposals from everyday people um, who, you know, often would told don't care about privacy, don't care about, or, or will, um, you know, are, are, are frightened of terrorism, so will accept incursions into their freedoms for the sake of protecting against terrorism. So there's there's a lot of opposition from there. There's also increasingly parliamentarians who understand this this situation that we're in and, and don't necessarily accept it. You know, the, Peter Dutton put up a, an identity um, services matching bill uh, a couple of years ago, which was extremely egregious in my view, insufficient privacy protections. It was about using facial recognition technology for national security purposes. And the committee that was reviewing it rejected the bill. They turned it down. They said this is unsafe and shouldn't be passed. That bill was then withdrawn. Now, I expect some similar form of legislation to come up again in the not-too-distant future, but I think it it, it was a, a defeat of sorts for Peter Dutton and for others who may think that they can just have this kind of um, very expansive pos uh, positions or, or legal imp uh, instruments just waved through. That's not really going to cut it anymore. The encryption legislation as well, that that was another example where there was significant opposition. The relevant parliamentary committee wrote a critical report. There were a lot of um, there were a lot of reforms that were ringed out throughout the course of the process. Like I'm not claiming these as particular victories. I think we've still got a long way to go before we can talk about them like that. But I wouldn't assume that we will fail every time. And that part of the work I think of being an activist and advocate here is to do your bit every time uh, without getting fatigued because you never know what kind of um, success you might have and that increasingly we get closer to a point where that mandate that we talked about, the capacity to just legislate in respect of 
counterterrorism in any way you like starts to evaporate. And I would I would like to think that in the last 10 years, the work that lots of people have been doing at Digital Rights Watch, but also in other places too, has really contributed to that mandate starting to, to disintegrate. And that I think is a really good thing. To be clear, no one disagrees that the tracking of counterterrorism financing and money laundering isn't a good thing. My only objection has always been that that now applies to every single bank account in Australia, albeit different risk group customers having different requirements for data collection. I think that's a very valid position. And what I would say is I know we're going to talk about gambling reform in a little bit, but plenty of governments have been more than happy to observe or to, to know about lots of money laundering occurring in casinos and gambling venues and, and not be too concerned about doing much about it. So, you know, I think there's um, money laundering and then there's money laundering. You know, there's there's um, instruments that are used to challenge counterterrorism or terrorism financing, I should say. That doesn't mean we should treat everybody as a suspect. You know, legislation, laws have to be targeted um and appropriately narrow uh to do their job and and i think we are right you know it's correct to be critical of um of laws that are broader than that uh because it's it's right to question why that why we should all be treated as suspects if there's no evidence for it while we're on the subject of national security i'd like to ask you about whatever the current situation is with julian assange yeah so um he's still obviously incarcerated now um and contesting his extradition to the united states um as I understand it, there's been a lot of back chat about whether he might be able to be released. He's obviously been incarcerated for quite some time now. Um, and Anthony Albanese, our Prime Minister, has been more supportive of that process being ended, not allowing him to be extradited into finding some other solution, um, which I think is a good thing. Uh, and now he holds office. Um, I'd like to see some of those historical uh, comments be turned into action. Uh, and I, I think there's a basis for it, uh, especially as the administration has changed in the United States. So um, I think probably the chances of him being freed are greater than ever. Uh, but, you know, it's a pretty serious risk he faces being extradited to the United States, um, being confined in in um, in a prison in circumstances that would really amount to torture, you know, by any respectable person's account of it. I think raises the stakes considerably. I don't think it's. Um, I think it's very reasonable to expect that he wouldn't be able to get a fair trial, and that his treatment of uh, during his incarceration would be, you know, extremely poor. For those reasons, I think there's a lot to be said for the idea that he might be able to get out before that uh, extradition takes place. Especially now, he appears to have friends, um, or at least people who are sympathetic to that that argument uh, in senior positions in the Australian government. So um, he's hoping that that's what transpires. I'd like to turn now to the subject of gambling reform. In your New York Times article called Australia Has a Serious Gambling Problem, you outlined how the game is rigged against the gambler, okay? You talked about how parasitic and deliberately addictive paper machines were but at the same time advocate for harm minimisation, not so much for getting rid of the pokies completely. Unlike the Greens who have recently rolled out their pull the pin on the pokies campaign, seeking to phase them out of pubs in five years, I think it is in clubs in 10. Given problem gamblers by definition are pathological and literally nothing will stop them once they're in the zone, as they all call it, define harm minimisation for us. And isn't removing the sharp object from the room, the obvious answer, as in removing the poker machines, given that everybody, including Tim Costello and the New South Wales Recent Crime Commission report, seems to endorse that? Well, I mean, I think the frame of harm minimisation is often used as an alternative to, say, criminalisation um, in relation to things like drugs and alcohol. Um, and I think there's a, a similar, um, similarly useful approach in treating and understanding gambling, gambling addiction, addiction as a health problem rather than something that is specifically about personal responsibility or willpower or um, bad behaviour, bad apples that therefore need to be criminalised um, and dealt with as a police matter, say, or, or a justice matter, rather than a health matter. So I think that's partly what motivates that kind of language, that um, gambling addiction is a health issue. It has all sorts of ongoing consequences socially um, beyond just the person who might be addicted. And we need to find ways to minimise the harm that's caused by gambling. Banning it sort of suggests that then there would be some kind of criminalisation of, um, of continued gambling. To me, that seems like a poor use of resources. And instead, we need to focus on uh, phasing out as much as possible these addictive kind of um, 
forms of gambling in particular, uh, much in the same way that, you know, cigarettes aren't banned, uh, but we are doing everything we can to minimise the impact of that industry. And if you treat, treat it as a health problem over time, you could see a situation where, you know, cigarettes are prescribed to someone who gradually um, reduces their addiction rather than, say, um, not able to be sold at all uh, and therefore, you know, people who might be addicted resorting to criminal behaviour. So I think that's the kind of idea behind that framing. Um, so, and the, and the other component of that is there just, there's a huge amount that can be done by government to minimise the harmful aspects of certain kinds of gambling, particularly poker machine gambling. I mean, poker machine gambling accounts for around a half of all gambling spend um, and increasingly sports betting is taking up a larger portion of all gambling spend in Australia. But for a long time, it, um, poker machine gambling was a considerable portion of gambling spend and other kinds of gambling, which tends to be less addictive because there's more breaks in play, there's less um, of an engagement with the machine, things like horse racing or, um, or say, lotteries, these things, they, they tend to be less addictive they don't have they do have their own problems don't get me wrong but gambling on poker machines really was you know it's what's been described as the crack cocaine of gambling because of the nature of how these machines are designed the dynamic created between the individual and the machine but also the capacity to control that you can reprogram the machine you can restrict how many are available you can also impose um, obligations on venues who host those machines but you can also you can also just get rid of them you know there's there's very little social aspect to some of these machines but of of course, this brings in a whole variety of social issues. The primary one, I think, is that that governments themselves tend to be addicted to the revenue. They take in a huge amount of, do of dollars from, from poker machine venues, um, you know, upwards of a billion dollars in New South Wales and Victoria and Queensland each um, per annum, a bit more for New South Wales, of course, a bit less for Queensland. Um, and then, of course, then there's this social infrastructure that exists alongside it. So New South Wales for a long time has had a lot of social infrastructure that claims it's dependent on gambling revenue, you know, sports clubs and the like, social clubs which I think really just look like glorified casinos. Um, but, you know, there's a claim from pubs and clubs in um, New South Wales that that's, uh, that kind of social infrastructure is unsustainable without gambling. I mean, I don't even want to say that Western Australia has no poker machines outside of the casino and they manage just fine in terms of having sports clubs and the like that operate without that. Um, so I think some of these arguments are quite spurious, um, but I uh, they still are made. And, you know, there's still many politicians who are beholden to that kind of um, at that argument, I suppose, that comes from um, from lobbying groups. And Clubs New South Wales is a seriously powerful lobbying organisation. They spend a lot of money lobbying. They have a lot of people who do it uh, and they seek to protect their interests. Um, you know, there's a reason that, you know, nearly a fifth of the world's poker machines are in New South Wales. It's really the biggest kind of place that you can go to gamble after Las, Ve Las Vegas and, um, and the like. Uh, it's a very shocking statistic, I think think that so many um, poker machines are in New South Wales and we really do need to change that. But you can imagine the kind of political forces that are on um, on the side of continuing the status quo that we have to kind of attack and, and resist. And I think increasingly politicians are starting to clock that um, not only is um, this a false economy because the costs associated with gambling are so high, so any revenue that they obtain, it's really robbing Peter to pay Paul because the, the health and social consequences of problem gambling um, far outweigh any revenue that they obtain. Um, but also increasingly as people watch their children in particular get inculcated into a culture of gambling, particularly as sports, bet, sports betting becomes more um prominent in people's daily experience of, of watching sport you can you realize that the, the kind of um the time's up a bit i think on gambling as being an acceptable um part of life even in new south wales and we're seeing changes in how politicians deal with this and i think that's a great thing i, I this is an issue that i've been following for a long time you know upwards of 10 years and the change is remarkable in terms of people's acceptance um and interest in this topic i think we've really made significant gains um from the last time that this was on the national agenda which was under julia gillard um and unfortunately that that period of reform didn't eventuate. Again, Andrew Wilkie was involved in that big anti-gambling campaigner. Um, uh, but yeah, I think it's it's we are again on the precipice of significant change, even in places like New South Wales, which until even relatively recently was seen as very difficult to get um, reforms or wins in um, in that jurisdiction. And, and now we can see that, in fact, on some things they are leading, which is very very impressive and and good to see.
Just on that issue of personal responsibility, your Times article referred to what you called the hoary line that gamblers should take personal responsibility, a line being pushed, obviously, by the gambling industry. Then you also talk about the bankrupt see immunity that gamblers inflict on their family themselves and on the wider community and the massive cost that's involved not only to people immediately affected but also to the economy. Where is the line then between state intervention and personal responsibility? How can we talk about keeping the government out of our digital private lives and not being able to impact our digital choices and then at the same time say they must do more to control people's personal gambling habits? I think this is such an interesting question and it's something I think probably lots of leftists kind of grapple with um, a lot of the time because, of course, um, we want the government to stay out of our business and allow us a form of autonomy, but we also want the government to protect us against um, certain things, you know, consumer rights being an obvious example. Like in the um, in my book, Digital History, uh, Future Histories, I talk about this in the context of um, car safety because actually, you know, Ralph Nader, the big consumer advocate, um, sometime president, uh, ca- presidential candidate in the US, was a big advocate for reforms to car safety measures, to regulating the car industry, and that there was a role to play in doing that. And there's estimates that he saved millions of lives because of, I mean, him and others, because of some of the advocacy to change regulations regulations around cars as an unsafe, um, I guess, product that needed to be regulated, that in an unregulated setting that um, people were just dying completely unnecessarily. And I think there is, uh, that you, we are able to draw a line somewhere. I think there is a role to play. I personally feel like there's a role to play for government in enforcing safety of products, um, of c- consumer protections. And I think there's a lot of um, important work to be done in asking government to do better at um, curbing the excesses of capitalists who seek to make products that are addictive or dangerous and seek to socialise the harms while privatising the gains of them. I mean, I think it's not contradictory to then say that you want the government to respect your rights in terms of how they uh, uh, deal with personal information or, or take the approach of keeping you safe. Uh, in a criminal setting, far too far, in my opinion. Um, And that criminalisation of uh, individuals is a a different matter in which we've seen a grossly overinflated police and surveillance state that needs to... um, to be pulled back and needs to have greater rights protections for individuals. So, you know, I think this is a, something that um, socialists and, and Marxists have been struggling with for upwards of 150 years. You know, what is the role of the state? Is it there to protect people? But when does that that sense of protection stop? But I think it's legitimate to make a demand that they um, that they force in a capitalist economy people who make dangerous products to pay the price of that, to be held accountable for it and and to stop doing it, while at the same time also saying that the government shouldn't be able to control our autonomy as citizens and that we need to have a robust protection of rights that give people the right to participate in society without being constantly surveilled. I don't think they're contradictory, um, but I think I understand that there's a, there's a tension there that um, I would love to see debated to a greater degree on the left because I think there's no particularly easy answers at a theoretical level. But in practice, there's still a lot we can do in the here and now to advocate in non-contradictory ways both of those of those arguments. In the context that Julian is still in jail, yet the former chief of the CBA, despite being found by the Royal Commission to have presided over about 47,000 counts of cash money laundering through the Perth cash deposit ATM, in that context, how do you have hope for the future? What's the way forward here? What's your response to that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's an argument that the law is used by the rich and powerful for protection and then enforced against the poor, you know, so I think that's absolutely true. Um, But, you know, consumer rights law, environmental protection laws, uh, union laws, work safety laws, these are all things that working people have agitated for and and won, you know, social movements have won. And I think that puts them in a slightly different category to um, criminal justice laws that have continuously been expanding Um, directed at disenfranchised, disadvantaged people as a way of managing social class and um, category for the last 200 years or so, um, those things are not the same. And I think it's worth thinking about the origins of some of these laws as a way of understanding their utility or assessing their political significance. You're a long-term advocate for gambling reform. 
You'd be aware that of the cashless gaming trial that's currently going on at Western Newcastle? Yeah, I have been following the um, cashless gambling issue for some time, obviously, since it has been talked about a bit in New South Wales and, and we're slowly moving towards an election in New South Wales in which it will be an um, important component. As I understand it, the gaming machine is connected to the person's mobile phone by Bluetooth, which works as a kind of cashless gaming card that has on it their preset limit, which is topped up from their private bank account, which is also on their phone. What's your view on that trial? Isn't that just helping the club collect even more data, giving them a now complete financial as well as facial recognition, CCTV and ID profile? That's a predatory, predatory marketer's dream, isn't it? Yeah, so there's a couple of different things I would say about this. Um, the first is that most that, that Clubs New South Wales is opposing cashless gambling because they see it as a threat to their business model, a threat to revenue from gambling. Um, and that's because, you know, the research suggests that breaks in play when it comes to poker machine gambling are what tends to reduce people's total spend. Um, part of the addiction with gambling is staying in what's called the zone um, when it comes to poker machines. So just staying there, constantly draining your funds until you essentially blow out the amount that you've got available to you and here's an example of creating friction slowing down play requiring people to take a break um, and and set maximum spends which which does impact that kind of addictive business model um, so there's some utility or there's some reason why clubs use of wells is opposing cashless gambling um, but also i think there's some utility in understanding how you could reduce the impacts of problem gambling particularly for the most addicted in society which does account for a very large amount of spend the productivity commission did a report on this a few years ago and they found that um anywhere between 40 and 60% of all revenue taken from poker machines is from problem gamblers. And if you include people who are at risk of developing a problem, the amount is even greater, pushing towards 80%. So there's a very small number of people who play them, or sorry, there's a small amount that's taken from lots of people who play them um, without difficulties associated with addiction, but there's a large number of, the large amount of revenue that's coming from people who are addicted or who are at risk of becoming addicted. And so this is a, an issue we have to target if we're going to come to terms with this problem. I think there's also a couple of different reasons why this has been proposed. Firstly, it would resolve the problem of money laundering. We were talking about money laundering before, but you know we know that, for example, there's a huge amount of money laundering that goes on in casinos. Um, you know, this is something that's come out in the various royal commissions. It's pretty egregious. It's pretty shocking. Uh, turns out, you know, at least in Melbourne, Crown Casino, they're unfit to hold a license. They're still continuing on. The casino is carrying on, but that's a pretty shocking finding from royal commission that that this kind of um, um, that the way that these casinos are operated allows this kind of money laundering. Here's an example of a program that would arrest that, uh, not permit money laundering through casinos and clubs. And that would be a good thing, in my opinion. Um, I mean, of course, then there's this secondary argument about does it allow a profile to be created of gamblers? There's, there's a couple of things I'd say about that as well. The first is that clubs already do this. So they already um, have very serious um, approaches to customer surveillance and know a lot about the people who use their venues. So uh, we shouldn't assume it doesn't happen already. But secondly, I think if you have transparent financial information, um, this does also create an obligation on clubs as well to perhaps intervene, um, to take their responsibilities under self-exclusion, but also um, you know, setting caps for spending much more seriously. Uh, it's much more difficult to turn a blind eye once you have that fi transparency of financial information. You know, at the moment, um, these clubs and and casinos can make profiles of, of individual gamblers and use them uh, to advance the the, the person's addiction, um, you know, with with very little difficulty. But then, um, you know, they can, they can also claim that they didn't necessarily know that their funds may have been misappropriated or um, the person may be spending beyond what they had stated they wanted to under a self-exclusion regime. So there's a, there's a responsibility that comes with that financial transparency as well. And the last thing I'd say about all of this is this is by no means um, the end of uh, anyone's uh, you know, views or aspirations in relation to gambling reform. But I think it is a step forward, um, partly because the way gambling is run, particularly in somewhere like New South Wales, is just so harmful and um, so, so devoid of significant regulation that would 
uh, limit those harms, that this is a step forward. But I, I don't think that this is the total solution to the problem of problem gambling. And there's plenty more that can be done, um, particularly around machine design, that could um, significantly improve the experience of people who are addicted to gambling. And, you know, then people who are around them who experience the consequences of this as well, um, you know, it vastly improve their experience of, of life as well. So I think there's... Um, yeah, there's a there's a justification in arguing in favour of a reform like this, while also keeping your eye on a greater aspiration for for reform more generally. I'd like to ask you now about steps individuals can take to protect themselves in relation to their privacy and their data. It's becoming increasingly difficult to access anything without an online account or log on, and it's very difficult to protect yourself when you find that outfits delivering government services like Service New South Wales, for example, are run by privatised operators. And with all the hacks that we've seen from government and non-government organisations, it's, it's pretty hard to protect yourself against all that, isn't it? Particularly when government services are increasingly delivered in a digital format by privatised outfits. How do people protect themselves from that? Yeah, so I don't want to be too glib about it, but advocating for privacy reform is one of the primary ways in which we can protect our privacy. Um, you know, that means not just um, placing more limitations on what companies and governments can do when they collect personal information, but also what they do once they've de-identified it or removed identifying features like a name and address and then still sell that de-identified information on or mix it with other data sets to better target advertising. You know, we're talking about gambling. Well, gam you know, Sportsbet spends hundreds of millions of dollars on um, gambling ad advertising and it uses data analytics to target people that it specifically thinks are open to using its product. So it does that not using, not because it knows your name and address, but because it knows certain qualities about you as a person that might make you more inclined to gamble. So privacy is not just about protecting your name, your personal information like that, but also about how that information is then used, mutated, analyzed and stored in different ways and used for marketing, predatory marketing purposes. So privacy reform, I think, is the primary way in which we can stop some of this, because if we can limit what people, what companies, what governments can collect, and then what they can do, even with de-identified data, we can stop this at its source. We can stop the data-driven economy at its source. And this is why I think this next 12 months in which privacy reform will happen is so critically important. We have models abroad, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation in Europe. It's not perfect, but if we achieve something similar in Australia, it would be a huge step forward. But there's also other models flying around that can limit these kinds of things. There's out, outright prohibitions on something like facial recognition technology, which involves taking biometric information, image of your face. We could just prohibit that, and there's models for that abroad as well. In Illinois, for example, there's a law that prohibits profiting from biometric information. That means that in Illinois, at least, lots of people don't experience facial recognition where in other states they might. And, you know, we can use these models here and apply them and argue that our Attorney General introduced the reforms like that to stop some of these industries in their tracks. And that would be a good thing. More generally, I think there's lots of um, digital literacy we could do to, you know, to, to reduce our capacity to be to be hacked. Things like two-factor authentication, stuff, authentication, stuff like that is very important, using a password manager, not using the same password twice, all these kind of practical tips. But I wouldn't want to give them um, without, um, you know, first putting in place the context. This is really a structural problem. It's not an individual responsibility one. It's a structural one. It's how our economy is designed. It's the laws that regulate personal information. That's where we need to be looking if we're really interested in protecting people's privacy, not just our own, but as a society. And this is fundamental to people being able to participate in public life, to people being able to make use of the incredible resource that is the internet to build communities, to experience and enjoy artistic, creative works, to communicate, to collaborate in, in protest movements, all these kinds of things that are so fundamental to our society that are facilitated by the internet. We absolutely need to deal with structurally how we regulate personal information and its use and better protect privacy to, to protect those fragile institutions of, that, that allow public participation in life. And that's what I'm aspiring to do in 2023 with Digital Rights Watch. Now that you have a son, as a new mum and looking to his future, what sort of future do you envisage for him? What is your hope for the digital world that he might live in when he's a grown man? 
Well, what I aspire to is a world in which you're not constantly wrestling with not just addiction to things like gambling, but also to devices. I think your capacity to regulate your attention and where you devote it and that you do so meaningfully is going to be one of the great challenges of any generation, any member of the next generation who will have a very addictive device in their pocket, probably at all times from a young age and working out how to navigate online life in a way that is meaningful without it being overwhelming or addictive is a life skill that I would hope I, I will have been able to teach him, but I, I'm not, I don't have the hubris to think that I will do better where others may have, have struggled. I think I'll definitely struggle with it like all parents. I'd like to be in a world in which we don't rely on large private enterprises for our basic online infrastructure, for socialising, for, for cre consuming creative content, for doing activism. And I like to think there would be public alternatives, socialised alternatives to that. And that's a real way in which um, in the 21st century, governments can intervene into the internet economy for the better. Uh, and I'd like to see a world in which surveillance, uh, government surveillance justified in the name of counterterrorism is no longer really permissible. And that that, uh, that um, accounting of uh, uh, in that political mandate has fallen on the side of rights rather than um, surveillance. And I look forward to that occurring. And I think that's going to happen shortly, but it's a lot of work that we've had to do to recast this narrative and to understand how government surveillance and, and, and national security agencies often put their interests ahead head of the interests of citizens in, in online settings. And that, you know, if we're interested in avoiding um, state-sponsored hacking, criminalised hacking, we need to rethink our approach to national security and how it treats personal information and, and being online. Uh, and so I, I look forward to a world in which some of the problems that we've had to deal with um, won't have to be dealt with by my son. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not at all, um, uh, uh, naive about the the centres of power that we're up against. And these are some of the biggest holders of power in society today, tech companies and governments. And so it's going to be a big job to, to resist their agenda. But I like to think a diverse social movement with lots of people from different social movements coming together to work on that is a recipe for success. Lizzie O'Shea, thank you so much for joining us on the Green Left Show. Thank you so much for having me on. Great questions. Thank you for joining this Green Lab show where we explore digital rights, privacy and all things big data with Lizzie O'Shea, human rights lawyer, chair and founder of Digital Rights Watch Australia. You've been watching the Green Lab show. If you like our work, go to greenleft.org.au and look at the many ways that you can be involved. Become part of the solution instead of part of the problem. You can also be a financial contributor from as little as $5 a month and enjoy our regular publications and online feed. My name is Suzanne James. This is the Green Left Show. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>